Hello and welcome to the Friday, December 11th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I am recording from Jacksonville, Florida. NCROC is a service that has steadily been gaining in popularity over the last uh, couple of years. And of course, with that popularity also comes attention from attackers. The goal of NCROC is uh, to allow you to expose internal services, usually for testing. That's uh, what they sort of advertise. But uh, attackers are also using NCROC for uh, backdoors. And we have yet another uh, Python script that takes advantage of NCROC to implement a simple backdoor. Xavier took a look at that script and uh, published as part of today's uh, diary the source code used by this particular bot. Well, there's certainly a number of good reasons why developers and such uh, would use NCROC. It's uh, something that you should probably pay attention to, even if it's used legitimately. It's something that needs to be uh, used with care because yes, you don't want to expose, for example, development systems and such uh, to the public by just exposing them via NCROC. And Cisco released a patch for its Jabber client on Windows as well as Mac OS that fixes a vulnerability that was thought to be patched back in September. Back then, a Watchcom security company uh, did uh, notify Cisco of these vulnerabilities. After the patch was released in September, Watchcom actually published quite a bit of details about these vulnerabilities, but well, well, apparently the patch wasn't complete and systems were still vulnerable. Earlier this week, I talked about the Electron framework, which allows you to write desktop applications using JavaScript and HTML. Well, this Jabber client is written in a similar framework, the Chromium Embedded Framework or CEF. And with that, it inherited, well, some of the basic issues that come by executing JavaScript uh, that is possibly then being injected via cross-site scripting. And that's exactly what happened here. So the vulnerability is very reminiscent of uh, some of these electron framework vulnerabilities where an attacker can use cross-site scripting in order to then execute arbitrary code on the client. In addition to this, uh, Cisco sort of made another flaw that uh, many others have made in the past, and that's allow access to SMB URLs. So an attacker could send a message with an image tag, and uh, this image tag then refers to an SMB URL, which uh, in this Jabber client will then trigger an outbound SMB connection. And as part of this, of course, uh, credentials will uh, be transmitted. They will be hashed, but well, it's just a good old NTLM hash, which tends to be pretty easy to reverse. So make sure you're applying this updated patch uh, because as I said, essentially lots of details about these vulnerabilities has already been released and exploitation is actually not that terribly difficult. Well, remember how it was about two weeks ago that I had at SCOTUS on the podcast talking about the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge? Well, uh, the challenge is live now. I'll add a URL to it uh, to the show notes again. And well, here goes, I guess, the time between now and New Year. Today I have uh, Karim with me, another SANS EDU student. Actually, Karim, that's your second appearance here on the Stormcast. Uh, could you just introduce yourself, please? Ah, uh, yes. My name is uh, Karim Lalji. I have just recently completed the MSISE with uh, SANS Technology Institute. And this is my second time on the podcast. So thanks for having me back. Yeah, last time it was like that cool cyberpunker uh, thing. So if anybody wants that look up, well, uh, maybe I'll add uh, the link to that paper as well. But you're actually done now. This was your your second research paper, and you took a very different topic here, uh, decentralization. Uh, can you first explain a little bit uh, what sort of these decentralization attacks are all about? 
For sure. And one of the reasons I chose this topic was I feel that this particular area is somewhat misunderstood, especially if you're um, in security, but maybe lacking a development background. So deserialization is the concept of saving basically volatile memory in a application. So when an application runs, it creates memory objects. And sometimes when you have distributed applications or server side components that are talking to each other, you need to save those memory objects and then reuse them at a later time. And so the concept of serialization and deserialization is basically a memory persistence technique where you're saving an object in some form, maybe in a database, on the file system, in a string, and then reusing it later. And that portion where you deserialize or take it from a saved state back into an object form is where things can go wrong. And that's kind of what we explored. Yeah, so when I first saw this years ago, uh, I was a little bit surprised, actually, that this attack worked uh, because it, it looks like a fairly simple uh, simple task you're you're taking an object uh, you're basically representing as a string and well and i guess my misconception actually was that uh, when you take this string and turn it back to an object you would parse it uh, but there's a difference between parsing and deserialization or uh, can you go into it a little bit uh, how we actually have a vulnerability there yeah, absolutely. And you're right. The The attack is, is freakishly simple uh, in the way that it works. And I could see why it would be uh, strange to think that this could actually work. But the idea is that you have an object, which is like a stencil, it has these different placeholders. And the string that we're looking at, or the, the file system, uh, the file that's saved to the file system, what they're, we're basically doing is we're taking the fields that belong in that object, and we're just basically placing them into the correct buckets. So there's very limited built-in validation going on. It's kind of left up to the developer to make sure that the object that they're receiving is actually the type that they expect. Uh, and, you know, I won't get into this too much here, but in the research paper itself, we'll actually see that a developer can explicitly say, this is the type of object I want to receive. And if you put a malicious object in there, the programming language will actually spit out an error but it doesn't matter because the attack has already been successful. So the fact that you saw an error message did not prevent anything from happening. Uh, so it's, it is really left up to the developer to make sure that they're sanitizing their inputs correctly. Yeah, so in essence, they shouldn't just blindly instantiate objects they're receiving. Is this sort of what this is about? Absolutely, so not just blindly instantiating objects and then running our own sanity checks and not leaving it necessarily up to the programming language to validate that the type of object that's being received is, is the correct one. Um, I also talk in the paper a bit about digital signatures for objects as well, because if you have, for example, a serialized data saved to a file on a file system, if that file can somehow be replaced, an attacker could potentially get remote code execution. So if there's digital signing going on, then the signature would fail and you, you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. <clears throat> so digital signature would really just prevent an attacker from modifying uh, the object. If whoever is creating the object is malicious, uh, then of course a digital signature would not necessarily help, right? Of course, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, what are some of the things that the developer sort of can do uh, to prevent uh, deserialization attacks? So in, in Java, we talk about using a special subclass or creating a validation routine in one of the built-in methods called the resolve class. So when you call deserialize on a particular object, it kind of goes up to the Java runtime to turn it back into an object from whatever state that it's in, whether it's a database or a string. In that period, all Java knows is that you're giving it an object, but there's no specification in exactly what type of object that is. So we can write our own resolve class method, and it's a little bit of extra work, but it's not very complicated. Again, uh, the code is outlined in the paper as well, where we can say, you know, I'm expecting the object of type sans or type student. And if you try and deserialize anything other than that, error the user out. And that's just one little extra sanity step that we can take. They're also, you know, of course, patching. You know, we're talking right now basically about deserialization vulnerabilities that exist in custom applications, but they exist in a lot of third-party components, right? We have Oracle WebLogic, uh, JBoss, all these different 
mechanisms or different commercial off-the-shelf applications that have known deserialization vulnerabilities, and we can mitigate that simply by patching them uh, when they're released. So you mentioned web logic and some of these external components, which of course is something that a lot of uh, Java-based, uh, in particular, uh, web applications uh, like to use. Why are they so vulnerable? Like uh, anything that makes them specifically exposed or vulnerable uh, to these types of uh, problems? Well, a lot of these components <clears throat> are built with the same code that our custom applications are built with. And as long as that commercial application is using a deserialization function without correctly validating it, you're going to run into the same problems that you will with custom applications. The other thing is a lot of these distributed applications or distributed software use things like RMI or remote method invocation. And that's a way for server-side components to talk to each other. And pen testers and attackers alike, very often when they see an RMI interface exposed, right away they're going to start thinking deserialization. It's just because that's often how RMI works. It doesn't have to use that, but generally deserialization and RMI interfaces kind of go together. Um, and I think deserialization kind of, although the attack is a concept, it's not it's not nothing new, but it seems to have gained more traction in the last few years. And because of that, I think now a lot of the patches are coming out. But when you have a legacy application that has not been patched, you're going to have exploitation attempts. And a lot of it was sort of about uh, Java, but uh, it may happen in sort of any object-oriented uh, language, right? Uh, absolutely. And that's actually one of the things I wanted to address in the paper, because as soon as we talk about deserialization, um, most people immediately start thinking about Java. And it's one of the more popular platforms. And if you Google insecure deserialization, chances are you're going to see an example that's Java specific. But I wanted to be really clear when we looked at this, that deserialization is a concept. It's, it has nothing to do with a language or platform. Um, so, you know, as long as you're saving objects in memory to a state and then reusing them at some point later, you're using deserialization and that can be hijacked. So in the paper, we talk about doing this in Java, in .NET, in PHP, and also in Android, because Android is also built in Java. And I know I've, I've submitted a pen test report where exploitation of insecure deserialization is done in a .NET environment. And the person who ingests that report is just kind of perplexed. Like, I, I thought this was a Java problem. Uh, and again, that's a little bit of a misconception. It has nothing to do with the platform. Yeah, so that that's pretty cool. Now, uh, you're all done uh, with uh, your degree. Uh, what's next? Uh, still writing any papers just because it was so much fun? Hey, you know what? I, I may consider doing that. Lots of things that I, I want to examine as well. So we'll we'll take a little pause and kind of just <laughs> let the brain settle a bit. But I'm I'm pretty sure I'll be back for more at some point. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, so thanks, Karim, for joining me again here. And as usual, a link to the paper can be found in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and talk to you again on Monday. Thanks. Okay.